Good morning. Good morning. I'm amazed to see so many people out this morning. I'm not. Because <laughs> Bell Hooks is here. <laughs> so I'm supposed to uh, introduce Bell, and I'm not going to try to do that. And uh, for those of you who don't know Bell, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> But I'm glad you're here. Um, and we will have a conversation with each other. I'll ask Belle some questions. She'll ask me a couple. Uh, we'll have cards, so um, fill out your cards. And we'll try to take questions, both by cards and maybe some live questions, depending on time. We're, as you probably noticed, we're always compressed for time. We have uh, too much goodness for the time that we have. Um, also, I want to just acknowledge that nothing's perfect. And even if something was perfect, it would be someone's idea of perfect, not someone else's idea. Uh, so part of this is giving space for things not to be perfect. Um, I'll forget something. I did the first time I spoke. You'll forget something. Someone will say something to be misunderstood. Someone will say something that they shouldn't have said. Um, so not giving peace, people a hall pass, but holding on to our connectedness, even in those spaces where we're not perfect. So I just want to invite that into the room. Um, also, you've heard me talk about my granddaughter. She's somewhere running around the building. Uh, you might see her. She's here with my daughter. Um, many of you know that I love this work, but the reason I'm here in Berkeley, Cal uh, Oakland, is because of my granddaughter. Um, who's five years old, uh, hanging out with her friend Antonio, who's about the same age. Um, so let me say a little bit about Belle. First of all, I'm not going to say that much I'm not about gonna Belle. I said I wasn't going to introduce you. <laughs> uh, so Belle is my friend. Uh, Belle is my teacher. And she, there's, you know, it's, it's like trying to say something about something that's so complex, so deep. Um, you need to be a poet, and I'm not a poet. Um, but I've learned from her. Um, and you know, I started learning from her by reading about her, by seeing her at a distance. And over the last several years, I've learned from her close up, um, uh, visiting in her home, having her visit in my home, having her come to Ohio when I'm there. Um, and one of the things that you know about Belle is that there's no box that can hold her. Um, and this conference has talked a lot about love, but not just a sentimental love, although there's nothing wrong with sentimental love, I think, but love in all its complexity. And that reflects Belle, love in all the complexities. And, um, and so the reason, even before Belle got here, that we've been talking so much about love, so much about belonging. In some way, this is your conference. This is about you. So uh, it's only appropriate that you're here up on the stage to continue uh, teaching me and teaching all of us uh, and sharing. So again, it's a delight to have uh, my friend and my teacher sitting next to me, Bell Hooks. If you have love, you have the community of belonging that comes with it. If you have love, you have the community of belonging that comes with it. I am so happy to be here with John and with all the other connecting forces of love that begin for us at Ohio State and now are out here. I'm thankful to be here with our signer who brings us love in another language, but we appreciate all the signers that have been here at the conference. Um, I haven't been to California in a while, a long while. I was, I was surprised how time passes um, for me. Um, these years have been spent with my parents dying, a sister dying, relocating to Kentucky, um, 
so John and I'll be talking about some of that because my, my book, Belonging, was all about this notion of where do we find that space of connecting, of belonging. Really, it's that space where there is no other. So, Bill, one of the things, I, I visited Bill uh, recently in Kentucky, and at the time you were working on uh, bringing to fruition the Bell Hook Center. So, and I, I, I've heard now that it's up and running, and can you share with us a little bit about it? Well, really, I began working on the Bell Hooks Institute in the wake of my sister dying. She gave herself in her, her last weeks of her life over to the patriarchy and had a very violent and sad death. But her death was unexpected, and it reminded me uh, so much of what happens if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't value ourselves rightly. And I kept thinking about all the black writers, male and female, who have not taken care of our legacy. And I felt push to think about what am I doing with Bell Hooks' legacy. And part of me felt the kind of uh, frustration that I thought, there should be somebody else out there who cares enough about Bell Hooks to be <laughs> working on you know, preserving her artifacts. Her, but, but no one came to the fore. Um, and I go to a church called Light of the World in Florida, and my pastor was saying to me, your heart has to be ready to handle the weight of your calling. And we were reflecting together about my calling. What, what am I called to do here? And as many of you have spoken to me this morning about how you were at some low point in your life and you began to read all about love or some other bell hooks work, and it lifted you up. You know that Jackie Wilson song, Your Love Has Lifted Me Higher? I am honored to be the vessel for that calling that allows me to speak words that lift people higher. And part of my coming into that fuller sense of self-love is to not be ashamed to have to gather my own resources. The Bell Hooks Institute so far is mainly supported by Bell. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been so jealous of John. John just has all these wonderful helpers surrounding him. I wish I could take them all back to nope, my nope, little nope. town of <laughs> Korea, Kentucky. But anyhow, I, I saw there were a lot of sort of very elite white schools that wanted my papers and other things. And I thought about the fact that when you go to the Beinecke or other places to see someone's artifacts or there, you have to sign in, you have to show ID. Increasingly, you have to go through metal detectors. And I thought, that's not what my work has been all about. <laughs> my work has been, and hopefully will continue to be, for the people. And so I wanted to create a space where anybody who walks in can see some artifact, can work with it. And it's been really interesting because my first naysayers were other black women, um, academic people who were telling me, Belle, you don't know what you're doing. You don't, you don't know anything about preserving artifacts. And I, th I thought, you know, they're absolutely right. I don't necessarily know what I'm doing, but I'm willing to learn. And so the Bell Hooks Institute houses the African American art collection, contemporary art collection, that I have been gathering for years. It houses an artifact room with all these silly little Bell Hooks things that don't necessarily interest me, but I was very fascinated. Uh, a young woman came to my house, um, and she came up to my bedroom, and there was the little brown baby doll that I write so much about. And she just began to weep, and she said, you know, there's the brown baby doll. And I recognize that artifacts mean different things to different people, and that there is a reason to hold on to artifacts and to display them. So all of that happens at the Bell Hooks Institute. And most excitingly, what happens is what I have wanted to educate beyond the academy. 
And so at the Bell Hooks Institute, people come who um, come to our Appalachian world, which is poor. 40% of the people in our world live below the poverty level. But people can come and talk together. I believe conversation, even though I'm going on too long, John, I'm sorry. Not a problem. I believe conversation is the best mode of learning. So I've had people come, and we bring people from the hollers and hills of Kentucky to be to mingle with some academic people. We just had the marvelous and wonderful Laverne Cox, who was um, the opening guest, featured guest at the Bell Hooks Institute. Um, and that was really, really great. Um, Laverne came completely without any funding from Bell. I wanted, I wanted to fund her and to pay her, but she wouldn't allow me to. Because Laverne is an example to me of somebody who I'd heard that, oh, Bell, Laverne is really into your work. And um, as I learned more about her, it, it was her brother who had turned her on to my work, this wonderful gay black man. Um, and I thought about how those connecting forces again, that through Lamar, Laverne had begun to read and study her bell hooks. And so that I honor those black males who read my work, who learn from it, who share it with others. But that sense of working with the work. John asked me, well, will you talk about where you are now? And one of the places that I am at now is really wanting to engage people working with the work in the dailiness of their life. I mean, I said to Laverne, you know, of course, I didn't know anything about Orange is the New Black. I don't really watch TV, but the pastor of my other church, our lesbian co-pastor, gave a talk, a sermon about Orange is the New Black. And I was like, well, what is that? And so I proceeded to look at all the episodes. Um, and I was not impressed. Um, <laughs> but I was most impressed by the character of Laverne, Sophia, and Crystal, her, his wife, because you saw in their interaction a level of non-othering, of Crystal's attempt to understand where Sophia is coming from in her transition from M to F. And I think that we have few models in popular culture and media, especially of black folks, showing that level of loving kindness and compassion. And it doesn't mean that they don't have conflict, because you remember that one scene when uh, Sophia wants um, Crystal to bring the drugs into the prison for her. And Crystal is like, are you out of your mind? I have a child to care for and love. I can't be putting him at risk. But they don't speak to one another with an aggression or rage, but they speak to one another in an effort to get to the understanding of different standpoints. And I was very moved by that. I have to say that when Laverne and I had our first conversation um, in New York, I wanted her brother to join us. And she said, are you out of your mind? You don't like orange. He doesn't like orange. I'll just be slaughtered up there on the stage. <laughs> so we didn't have him. But anyhow, I went on a little bit too long. I'm sorry, John. Well, not at all, not at all. So, so one of the things you mentioned, Bell, and, and, and many of you know me personally, so uh, an opportunity to talk to 700 of my new friends. Um, you mentioned about your sister dying. And I think it's hard to actually really live life and hard to really love unless you actually acknowledge and in some profound way start to come to terms with death. Um, and you know, all of us come with an expiration date. We don't know exactly when it is, but it is. Um, this year I'm visiting my father. Uh, you hear me talk about my father a lot. He's turning 95. Um, he grew up as a sharecropper. Uh, he's legally blind. And I feel so lucky to have him and to have had my mother, and now to have my children. Um, but also, I'm aware that this expiration date is soon. Uh, he's aware of that. And so when you talk about your sister, and in some way that actually motivating you, um, if you could talk a little bit about death and love, 
and how that actually helps us give meaning to life. And I, I think love prepares us um, to live well and to die well. And I think one of the things that's so annoying about imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy <laughs> is that... <laughs> It not only does not afford us lives of optimal well-being, it does not afford us the right to die with optimal well-being. And I am deeply concerned, I mean, John asked me to talk to some of the things that are motivating me at this point in my life. One is the whole issue of women as caretakers of elders and women who are then themselves often left alone without caregiving and taking for themselves. My older sister who cared deeply for mom and dad during the last years of their life, shortly after they died, she was diagnosed with dementia. Uh, her husband that we had previously thought was a sweet and loving man, he quickly put her in an institution, not a very great institution, and it just reminded me again of this is a feminist issue the issue of elder care and of how, of how we die. And I, I think about it all the time, John, how, how not to be afraid of death. Because I think that just as this culture of domination abuses and assaults so many of us in the dailiness of our lives, it abuses and assaults so many people at the time of their dying. And we don't seem to take it seriously. I find so many people don't want to think about dying. And even when I talked about the Institute and starting it, so many people said, oh, Belle, you don't need to do that now. Why are you thinking about what happens beyond your death? And I think about all the black folks who haven't thought about, the writers especially, who did not think about what happened beyond their death. And think about uncaring, dysfunctional families now controlling their work. The gay writers whose families won't let anything be presented about them that says they're gay. Um, so many things that happen if you don't take care of your living and your dying. So again, two of my favorite subjects. What, loving and dying? Loving and dying. Um, one of the things we've been doing here at this conference of trying to do is redefine boundaries. They don't go away, they're, they're, uh, they become reconstituted, and redefine groups, redefine our connection with each other, ourselves, and the earth. Um, and I'm aware that even as we think about who in our tribe is not here, we need to constantly redefine our tribe, who are members, who are, who are willing to be members with me? Who are willing to be in a tribe with you? Who are willing to be in a relationship with the earth? So you talk about loving. Mm. Um, we can think about it in terms of loving oneself, loving each other, and loving the earth. Can you say a little bit about that and how, to, how do we lean into that in a real way so that it's not just an idea? I think we lean into it first of all by not thinking about a tribe or a bounded sense of love. I mean, one of my deepest struggles in my own life around love is with people that really turn me off and people that um, I don't want to include in the circle of compassion. Or, and that, to me, is the challenge. I mean, Henry Nouwen in Return of the Prodigal Son writes about the fact that it's not hard to love the people that we like and that we share with. And that's not where the challenge of love is, that the challenge of love is to extend belonging to someone that we may not even know, someone that may um, actually have hurt us. And you know, you all know many of us are hurt within family. And yet, at the same time, we're often still enmeshed with family. And so how can we extend to family members whom we may not want to know or talk to, or may not want to talk to us, that level of compassion. Because I think the true belonging, and this is something Thich Nhat Hanh has helped me to see, is the belonging that is inclusive, that doesn't 
make me choose people that look like me to care about. I have recently become very engaged with a conservative white male businessman. I, I, um, his daughter, in her junior year of college, went on a road trip with her roommate, and the roommate fell asleep at the wheel, and his daughter died. Um, and he was so moved, and they had argued throughout um, in their friendly conversations about feminism. And she had really hoped for him that he would become what she called a hardcore feminist. In, in the wake of her death, he raised two point something million dollars at De Pere, in De Pere, Wisconsin at St. Norbert's College to open up the Women's Center there um, and to have the Women's Center, which is now the Cassandra Voss Women's Center. She was a reader of Bell Hooks. And in their celebration of this moment, they invited me to come for the year of bell hooks. They had a whole year reading bell hooks, uh, having people come. And when I went there and met him, I was deeply moved. I kept thinking, how, how many places in our nation do we have conservative Christian white businessmen committing themselves? It took five or six years to raise the money to a women's center, uh, to a center, center where gender can be talked about expansively and fully. And that was a real challenge to me in meeting this person and in opening my heart and my life because he was different. And it's been interesting because I think all the time that we talk about um, inclusivity. But in fact, as I have drug Kurt around with me to talk about his work, so many of my black friends have said, Bell, He's just, he's, he's just a foyer. He doesn't belong with us. He's not like us. He, he's not hip and cool. Um, and I have to admit that there are times that I felt like, wow, he really isn't hip and, and, and <laughs> cool. And so where, where does that put that space of belonging? And that, I think, is our world's global challenge right now, to have the willingness to embrace all of the, the conditions of the world. And I, I think it starts with the earth. I mean, to think about water. I mean, people are constantly talking about oil and gas. But you know what? We can live without oil and gas, but we cannot live without water. And millions of people in this world are struggling to have water, clean water. Thousands of children dying daily because they don't have clean water. So there we see that our, our connection to love begins in the body and the needs of the body. And one of those needs of the body is the need for water um, to live. So that I think that uh, if you see the film A Fierce Green Fire, one of the things that it shows is how many people of color and how many black people in this nation have been a part of the environmental movement from its beginning. Um, and so we don't forget that we are, we do not let ourselves be othered by being told, well, black people aren't interested in the environment. Well, in fact, we know uh, Manuel Pastor, I don't know if he's here, he makes the point that uh, Latinos as a group are the most avid environmentalists in the country. That's not the stereotype. And we know the first environmentalists yes. in the country were people called Native Americans. Uh, yeah. uh, so as Shakti suggested, who gets to define? Who says? Um, can we actually bring in all those who don't think of themselves as environmentalists? And I guess I want, I want to suggest that to be inclusive, to be an environmentalist, to love, the cost can't be you have to be cool. The cost I know, can't that's, be. It's so hard for me, John. But you have to be hip. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to remind you to fill out your index cards and hold them up. We'll be taking questions in a little bit. Um, Bill, I want to give you a chance to ask me any questions that you have. Well, I'm really interested, John, in your move from uh, Ohio to California and, and what you find different about the California context. There are a lot of differences. Uh, uh, first of all, people oftentimes, when I tell them I was in Columbus and then now I'm here in the Bay Area, and they say, wow, you know, you're so lucky to get out of Columbus. Uh, I don't feel that way. Um, and I jokingly say to, sometime to people, I came to the Bay Area because I wanted to be in the center of the universe. 
and people sort of look at me like, well, that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, egotistical in terms of the Bay Area being the center of the universe. The conference was opened by a friend of mine, uh, Gabor Basri, who's one of the few black astrophysicists in the country. Um, and what he would tell you is that every place, every place in the universe is the center of the universe. Um, so we are in the center of the universe, but so is Ohio. Uh, <laughs> and as I said, to me, the work is really important. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about death. Um, my daughter's here, and uh, when she blessed me by giving me uh, um, my granddaughter, and you know, you can hope for a second blessing sometime, but. Uh, <laughs> I talked to her and I said, in some ways, I felt like my life was complete. Um, that if I died the next day, I could die at peace. And my daughter said, my daughter said, no, 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 don't be talking about death and you know, come on, you know, you gotta stay around and watch your granddaughter grow up. But, but that was real. Uh, and um, I was about to go to the University of Texas, UT Austin, uh, and they, they've given me a really great deal. I loved it down there. And Sunita called me. She said, you got to be in the Bay Area with your granddaughter. Uh, so the work's really important. Uh, but so is my family. And so is those that I love at a distance, but also love up close and personal. So the biggest difference is to have my, my daughter and my granddaughter here. I think it's a fabulous area, but it's an area with a lot of problems. Uh, There's what I call a lot of um, sort of progressive libertarians. Uh, people who are who think they're all that <laughs> and more. Back to notions of cool. Yeah, exactly, cool. And and in some ways, in my mind, uh, for all of the diversity and greatness here, the the lack of real community and the sort of deep um, egotistical individualism with a progressive Ooh. hip tinge uh, is problematic. say I'm always moved when John talks about caring enough as a, as a black man in our society um, making the work of being with your family because this is certainly a counter hegemonic vision of black masculinity yeah. that you care enough to move with your family to do the work of love with your family because we we recognize how deeply wounded black males are who are fatherless, who are family-less. I think I have read three memoirs in the last few weeks. Uh, Kevin Powell's new memoir that's coming out, um, the memoir by Jan Gay of Marvin Gay, Charles Blow's memoir, and each, in, in each of those books, males are subject, black males, to such violence by other black people, by mothers. The violence uh, in, in Kevin Powell's book of his mother towards him, his own violence as a child. So one of the things I was thinking about, I was recently on a panel with Beth Ritchie, who has been hired by the NFL to teach and do work around domestic violence. And one of the things we talked about in terms of violence um, and violence as it begins in the family is that violence is othering. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, when we work for peace, we're already doing the work of belonging because violence estranges us. I mean, just reading Charles's memoir, which starts with the incest um, scene of the older young black male towards him and how that thread of a certain kind of violence runs throughout his life until he begins to reclaim himself, as he told us, that certain forms of violence estrange you from yourself and wound you in that place in which you would know love. And as black people, as people of color, we suffer the wounds in that place where we would know love so that we can't begin to think about the inclusiveness without first healing those wounds 
I mean, and I talked with Charles yesterday. I was, uh, what I wanted to hear more from Charles, and hopefully we will in the future, is what it was the process of healing, where he, he used the word trauma throughout his talk yesterday. And I, I think as people of color in this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, as white people who are also wounded, I mean, one of the best films, I think, for showing how wounded white people are, Spike Lee's film, Four Little Girls. When that young white boy realizes that his family has been involved in the death of those girls and the cover-up, and you see the woundedness to his spirit and his sense of self and identity, so that we're all working, we're, we're all under these kind of heart attacks right now, because our hearts are constantly being assaulted. You know, I, I talked about, um, and the violence talk about people calling me saying, oh, you've got to see this television show, Empire. And I, I watched one show, and it was this one show where the little boy is dressed kind of like a girl, and the, the father, uh, the angry black heteronormative father, you know, picks him up, runs outside, and throws him into a trash can. It was one of the most violent, anti-gay, homophobic, moments, visual moments. And I didn't need to see that. I didn't need to have that in my head. Because I want to say this to us, simply, people said to me, oh, but they're dealing with gayness. I said, no, simply showing us violence towards gay people is not an intervention. So we have some questions. And as we sort of uh, pivot to the questions, uh, Bill, I want to throw out one other thing and, and have you help me with this. Uh, a friend of mine, a friend of over 50 years, was here last night. I don't know if he's here today. And he talked about um, how powerful things were and, and, and hearing things, but that even the repeating of the violence of black men violence toward black men, he said, I know that. I, 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 want, to, I want to hear something else. I want to hear something positive. Um, and you know, as, as, I, as I move through the world, I've been struck by how almost everybody I get to know is wounded. Almost everybody. You know, white professionals, straight people, gay people, um, transgender people, rich people, poor people. You know, it, it actually brings me close to uh, the teaching of Buddhism that there's profound, profound suffering. Yes. And, and none of us get to go through life without that. Um, and, I, and I guess I would just push a little bit. I don't think we end the suffering and then engage life. I think engaging life is what ends the suffering. Uh, or allows us, and maybe it never ends, but allows us to hold it, allows us to uh, be yes. with it uh, in a different way. Um, so I want to invite that into the room. that. And, and sort of invite, what's next? You know, we know that we have a sordid history, uh, a shameful yes. history, uh, the way we even got this place called the United States, uh, the, the, the ravageness of Native Americans, and now the disappearance uh, of Native Americans, the, the slaves, the, the taking the land from uh, uh, Mexico, uh, the putting whites in indentured servants, uh, and actually stripping them away from uh, the earth. And so we have this sordid history, but we also have this possibility. And I guess I want us to spend some time thinking and talking about this possibility. Um, I think we have to talk about the activism in relation to possibility. I mean, Charles used the phrase at one point of pornography, and I, I write about the pornography of violence when he raised the issue of when we are watching these scenes of black males being killed over and over on our television screens. We are, I believe, colluding right. in the violence against black males as a form of entertainment or stimulation. So the question becomes, how do we, you know, where is our activism in relation to that? Uh, one way of activism is that we are not allowing that. I mean, Thich Nhat Hans constantly says, you are what you see. Um, what are we doing to raise up different images of black masculinity. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And just to give you one example, when I uh, left the uh, streets of Detroit uh, on a train to go out to Stanford to go to school, and I get there, and people said to me, so do you know your father? 
because the image was black people didn't know their father. And I'm saying, what do you mean do I know my father? I mean, I didn't even understand the question. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like saying to a, an Asian American, where are you from? You know, it's like, uh, and probably most of us don't know the group that is most likely to be in relationship with their children if they're separated men from the, from the, um, the mother are black men. That image of black men is not lifted up. It's not celebrated. So I'm saying, I mean, I feel so fortunate to have my dad and my family. Uh, and I feel like, uh, in a sense, all of you are a little bit deprived that don't know my dad and my family. <laughs> <laughs> But you probably have your own. Uh, but anyway. Well, I think that leads us, John, to ask, what are you doing every day? Mm -hmm. um, I gave a sermon at St. Norbert's. Um, this is still Easter week for those of us who are practicing uh, Christians and believers of other faiths and, on resurrection. And, and we talked about, I talked about um, Jesus, um, Simon Peter's betrayal of Jesus. And that when Jesus brings him back from otherness into belonging, he raised the question, do you love me? And then the third question is, if you love me, feed my sheep. And the point of my homily was, what sheep are you feeding? So that I think all of us can ask ourselves, what is, what is our relationship to black masculinity? Or to all the other lives, the, the pain, and sadness that so many black women endure as we are rendered invisible, and the violence against us going unseen. Trans black women who are murdered every day in our society. So what are you doing? If you love me, feed my sheep. Because I think if we don't ask what we're doing in the dailiness of our lives, um, not activism that's about rushing to Ferguson, um, being a part of spectacles of resistance, which have their place, but the dailiness of life, mm -hmm. where change happens, the local. I'm very involved in the local, um, because I think we can do so much where we are. Pima Chodron says, start where you are. So I think I invite all of you to start where you are um, in relation to ch changing images, changing um, who you value, how, you, how do you show your value? You know, how do, how do white people who are in active resistance to white supremacy show their love of people of color? I'm always unhappy when I'm in circles of very leftist, uh, liberal white people, and then they have no people of color in their lives. They're saying all the right things about anti-racism, but then they're not practicing. Um, and, one of the things that drew me to Buddhism, John, more than Christianity, was the notion of an active practice. What am I doing in the service of that which I say I believe and hope for? So I think that's, that's something definitely we, we, we like our white brothers and sisters to think about. You know, what are you doing in the dailiness of your life in the service of anti-racism? What are you doing to bring a person of color into your life. What does it mean that, I mean, I don't even know how people can live lives without people of color. I mean. Well, so, so Belle, I want to make one comment on that uh, and, then, uh, and, then and then pivot to one of the questions. Um, you know, I jokingly say to my students sometimes that in a world that's really fair and just and kind, no one will have to live their whole life as a white person. Uh, and, and I'm only partially joking. Uh, but I also want to suggest that, you know, there's injuries and wounds that we uh, inflict on each other, even those of us who are oftentimes in a vulnerable position. Yes. So, um, you know, sometimes, for example, uh, I've watched uh, black people not only inflict harm on white people, but black people inflict harm on other black people. That gay people not only inflict harm on uh, straight people, but inflict harm on other gay people. So part of the inclusiveness is not just from whites to blacks, but it's like everybody 
everybody. Well, Everybody's think, injured and everybody has something. It's about accountability too, that I have to recognize that there are times when I'm a victim and there are times, like for example, in my class positionality, we've not talked, I think, enough about capitalism and how the fact is how those of us who have class privilege, me and John both, um, he has a little more class privilege than I have. <laughs> but the, the point is that the, to be able to look at ways in which I'm both oppressed potentially and then oppressor, mm -hmm. because it's that sense of, that understanding of accountability, that we are all accountable. That's our democratic space of belonging. Mm -hmm. That as long as we are only projecting out there to the other who is oppressive, we cannot really have belonging. Right. Because belonging is about the acceptance, the deep and profound acceptance, first of all, of reality, of what is. And the reality is we are all capable of enacting that violence, that estrangement, that colonialism, that imperialism, and to be able to be vigilant in our lives about where do I enter into that? You know, one of the things I've noticed is that as black people become more famous or more privileged, we don't like to talk about capitalism and money and, and what we're doing. You know, where, where are my resources going? Because um, I think that all of us are called to question um, our participation in capitalism because we, this is a system we live within, this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. And to be able to say, where do I enter into that as a person with potential power to harm others? And what keeps me from engaging in those violent acts of estrangement? So, so, let me, so here's one question. Talk about being an ally, uh, about the sacrifices that need to be made for equity, how to talk to people. Uh, so that I, that we understand the question is they're saying, how do groups be allies with other groups? Um, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I think, for example, about my connecting with Laverne. I mean, I live in the Bible Belt, and it was very sad to me that there were professors where, where I teach that would not come to hear Laverne because they said that she was an abomination. And so I think that, you know, um, I considered the weight of, Belle, you're opening the institute in the Bible Belt here with a trans person, you know, and how is that gonna affect how people perceive the the institute, how people perceive you. And so I think that when we think about, I, I like the fact that the person brought up sacrifices because I think that when we choose to allow ourselves fully for freedom with groups that are not ourselves or, you know, I, I got a letter from a young woman who said that here in California in 1986, she said in my class and she didn't say a word and, but that she began to experience the, the teaching as transforming her life. And her mother said to her, you can follow that lesbian mess if you want to. Um, speaking of me, uh, if you, <laughs> but you will end up manless and miserable. But she was saying how, she was, she was restating her joy that she hadn't ended up miserable, that, that <laughs> feminist theory and practice had brought her to a new level of satisfaction and joy and self-love in her life. So that I think that we have to be aware that there are consequences in allying ourselves. And that, um, that when you do that work, there is an element of sacrifice and, and of having to learn different languages, different ways of being. Language is also a place of struggle. So that that's one of the big issues, I think, as we seek to ally ourselves um, with different groups of people. So, so let me just comment on that before I go to the next question. Um, to some extent, I don't think of us as allies because I don't think of us as separate. Huh? Uh, and, um, Good theory. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm trying to make it into a good practice as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and, and I don't know entirely where this comes from, but I'll tell you a very quick story. I, I think some of you know the story that uh, my father and, and parents, uh, very Christian, very fundamentalist, and um, so I, I can't remember starting to go to church. I, I, 
I was always in the church. And then I started reading a lot when I was fairly young, and I started reading about Chinese. And I lived in Detroit. I'd never seen a Chinese person. Uh, but the doctrine of that church was that if you didn't accept Jesus and be baptized, you're going to hell. And I knew enough about the Chinese that, to know they weren't about to accept Jesus. <laughs> and so uh, I went to my father's church. The preacher preached, it was my father. And um, at the end of the sermon, every sermon, they always said, are there any questions? And it never occurred to me that in all the time I'd been at that church, no one had ever asked a question, right? <laughs> But this day they said, are there any questions? And I said, I stood up. And the whole church went, <gasps> <laughs> And I was 11 years old. And I said, Brother, Brother Manuel was speaking. He said, that's all right, that's all right. Brother Powell, what's your question? And I said, what's going to happen to the Chinese? <laughs> and this is a black church in Detroit. <laughs> I never went back to that church. Uh, and it created probably the major rift in my life with my family. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, I wasn't doing that because I was allies with Chinese. I didn't know what Chinese, but, I, but it just seemed wrong. It, and it seemed wrong to who and how I was trying to live in the world. So, so in some sense, I think if we really expand the circle of human concern and expand the, 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 heal the schism with the earth, then it's not, I'm not saying we just get merged, merged into others, but we also, it becomes porous. We actually are working out our salvation, our love, our life, by our relationship, by remembering, by holding all those parts. So the, to me, you're talking about an ethical, when, I mean, when Charles kept saying um, that he wished people would make a moral decision, an ethical decision. So John, at 11 years old, had weighed, can all of these people be wrong in order for us to be right? Are all of these Chinese people going to be condemned to hell? And he made an ethical leap of community, a sense of, I can't accept this. And I think that, you know, as, as we talk about our revisionary struggles for liberation, we have to include ethics mm -hmm. um, more, an ethical sensibility. Because where, where do we know what is right, what is just, if we don't have an ethical sensibility? What's another question, John? Okay, so here's a question. <laughs> This is one of those profound questions that come up all the time. Why don't you capitalize your name? Both of you. That's <laughs> all I can say is John is a copycat. <laughs> Let's not talk about that one. Let's go on to something else. John. Okay, Bill doesn't like that question. One response, though. It's not bad to copy as long as you're copying the right person. <laughs> What are some daily life habits that allow for active service without burnout or that allow for self-care? It's funny because I'm writing, trying to write a new book. I um, decided that one thing I could do in my local community is I do these what I call spirit talks. And people can come to me. I was trying to find an economic way out of academe. And so I thought, well, I'll, I will do these spirit talks for $20. People can come and talk to me. Uh, and they can bring a problem, and we will work together to solve it. So one of the things that I found is that people would bring the problem, we would solve it, but they didn't want to pay me the $20. Um, so that was an interesting sense of, I, I, I'm always sort of looking at daily life. Like, I mean, how can I, as a theorist, because I think of myself as an intellectual and, and a theorist, how can I give of service um, because as a committed bodhisattva, my, my concern is service with, to others. Um, so that I think that in the dailiness of life, I begin my day with meditation, inspirational reading, um, prayer, um, and then think about what, what will be the service that unfolds in the, in the dailiness of my life. Um, how can I make that change where I am? in the local world that I live in. Um, and that to me is just really important. Uh, Wayne Dyer and others have written a lot about intentionality. So that I think about what are intentionalities. Every day I write down what my intentions are for the day. Because they guide me in the direction of service. To love, to give, to serve. 
Thank you. So here's one more. Uh, I think this is a great question. This conference is about transformation. What advice do you have for, it says philanthropy, but I'd say for all of us, so that this is not just a one-off uh, and that this goes forward. So how do we actually make this conference uh, a reality um, this, so that we are creating belonging in a transformative way? I think maybe in the future we won't stop at the conference, that we might have what is the next meeting together be where people give testimony to what the conference has done, um, what they have done in relation to the teachings of the conference. I mean, because you know, many of you have come up to me to give your testimony, um, to, to bear witness to what Bell Hook's work has done for you. And a lot of people have said, well, I know you hear this all the time. And I say, oh, but you know, that I can't hear enough because that is the spark that ignites me, that reminds me who lives in the little t all white town for the most part in the Bible Belt, uh, a life of tremendous solitude, that there are people listening, there are people working with the work. So even if we just uh, had a newsletter that was published out of this conference where people talk about, this is something that I learned at the conference and this is how I put it to work in my life. So let me check with uh, my curator here in terms of time. Um, do we have any more time? 31 seconds, John. <laughs> five minutes. No, she's giving us five more minutes. Uh, so one thing, so we'll, we oh, want to take. Uh, let me interrupt John to say, um, <laughs> I want us never to forget that humor has to be a part of the revolution. That there will be Yeah, some of you may remember there was a saying which says the revolution will not be televised. It didn't say it wouldn't be fun. Uh, uh, so what I want to do is two things. On the question that was just asked in terms of going forward, obviously that's a big issue for us. And we want all of you to sort of help us with that issue. Because uh, we don't want this to be one off. Uh, we, I think we have a different framework. Uh, we're bu building on the framework that many of you have already introduced. But we don't want this to be a one off. So I want you to think about that, not just for um, the rest of the day, but going forward. How do we connect? How do we give this life? How do we actually make this real? I think we can take two live questions, um, if they're short and if they're questions. Uh, well, while John is busy changing the direction without collaboration, I want to say um, that I encourage all of you to remember that activism takes all kind of forms and that there's not been many times in your life that you have seen a black man and a black woman, both people who are thinking in leftist, cosmopolitan ways of love together. And that our very presence here together is a form of activism. Um, I, can, I can sincerely say that I didn't want to come. Um, because I have been working so hard on the Bell Hooks Institute and then I had, I just felt like I didn't have the energy. But then I felt I really need to come and stand with John and be with John and have, have that spirit that I hope will be the growing spirit among black females and males in our society of caring, of compassion, of loving kindness. Who has that short question? <laughs> So uh, I think there should be people with mics around. So short question. And also, I want to make sure in the overflow room that people have had a chance to participate. So do we get any questions from the overflow room? OK. Um, question? OK, there's a question over there. OK. Your name? It's on. I'll go. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Jesus Valenzuela. I'm coming up from Salinas. And uh, my quick question. Uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, for everything. And my quick question is, um, for those of us that actually have access to like the media, we can actually publish things. Um, I've heard a couple of times in this conference, like reclaiming the narrative, right? How can we as people of color really uh, kind of push that out there, right? Reclaim the narrative. And hmm, yeah, just it. <laughs> Did you understand that? I, I like the idea of creating the narratives. 
uh, rather than some reclaiming. Because I think that we are always in the process in the spaces where we live. I mean, I, I brought this whole thing about home as a place, how people of color must make our homes sites of resistance, um, and how my home is the one place where I'm not in any way a victim of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. So that I think that the, the issue of self-determination and self-determination in relation to the media, how do we use um, the, the resources that we have um, to create uh, different spaces, different ways of thinking, to bring to the fore um, what we are doing as active resistance in changing the structure of our lives, not in reaction to whiteness or, or domination, but in um, the space of creation and creativity. And I, I see that, John, as a space of hope, because I definitely see more of the younger people in our lives wanting to create from a space of hope and self-determination than reaction to. And we, we have time for one more question, just a, uh, one comment on that. They found that after uh, the 10th, year, 10th anniversary of 9-11, there was all this stuff on the media about what happened. And what they found is that it re-traumatized people. And so you know, sometimes yes. Uh, yes. my friend um, and, and colleague Michael Lomi said the other, the last night, he said, uh, I made a mistake. And then he told me what the mistake was. And I said, it's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing to keep repeating it. Right? to keep retelling the story. Now, sometimes you want to tell the story because you need that to ground you. But also, yes. you need to go beyond the story. So yes. we need to actually be willing to go beyond the story. What's, what, what are we bringing in? What are we, who, we're midwives. What are we giving birth to? Uh, so last question. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Abbas Idris. I'm a grad student at San Francisco State University in the communications department. And uh, my question is, um, Bellows, if you could speak to how can, as a black man, how can we learn to love ourselves when we live in a police state that hates us? Well, I think that how do any of us learn to love ourselves? I think about the family. Because most of us, I mean, I have to say it, most of us have learned to hate ourselves in the family. Not, not some white supremacy or patriarchy that's out there or imperialism that's out there, it's been what, has, what is happening in the family. So that I think if we think about how to, what can I change within my family? How can I begin to move from dysfunction to function? That is to me so crucial, because we've already seen what happens when we're dysfunctional and we take our dysfunction into the movement, whatever the movement for social justice is. If we take our dysfunction into that, it usually then reeks of that dysfunction. So how do we begin to undo? You know, we do have to remember the trauma. I kept thinking as I was reading Charles's book that, that his very writing of the book was about freeing himself from the chokehold that his childhood experiences had on his spirit and his life so that he could be free. <coughs> I, I personally, I'm a good, be deep believer in therapy. That, you know, I mean, I believe that spiritual growth can be crucial to healing from trauma. But I think that before we can do anything with other people, we have to find that place of healing so that we come in good spirits to one another, so that we come with integrity to one another. Integrity being congruency between what you think, say, and do. So we're going to close and thank you all for the wholeness and integrity that you've brought to this conference um, and the spirit of joy. Yeah.